Grab your Bibles this morning and uh, open them to the book of Matthew, chapter 13. Matthew 13. I'm going to tell you a dirty story this morning. It's about dirt. That's what you were thinking, right? When I said dirty story, you thought dirt. I'm sure you did. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 and then verses 18 through 23. And I'm just going to read verses 1 through 9. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and a great crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, The sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And there's your dirty story. This teaching of Jesus on the beach that day is an example of what's called a parable. It's mentioned in the scripture there in verse 3. What is a parable exactly? You've probably heard the expression, I know I've used it over the years, that a parable is an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. And, and what that means is this, that Jesus, Jesus often taught or communicated spiritual truth by using illustrations from everyday life, things that people would understand, such as farming. Parabolic teaching, however, was not unique to Jesus, but it was a central feature of His teaching. And through the parabolic ministry or teaching of Jesus Christ, he revealed vital truths about the kingdom of God, what it means to be saved. And so if we are to understand the teaching of Jesus, especially as it pertains to the kingdom of God and what it means to be saved, then we have to understand His parables. Now today's parable has often been called the parable of the sower. But if you read the parable, you see that the sower, while he's a part of the story, he's not the focus of the story, is he? It's not the farmer. Actually, it's the dirt. The dirt is the focus. So we could say it's the parable of the soils or a dirty story. The parable of the soils is probably the most well-known of Jesus' teachings. And it's a parable he explains fully. So we don't have to guess at what he's teaching. So when we look at this parable, we're going to divide it into two parts. The part that I read to you this morning, verses 1 through 9, will be the parable given. This is the earthly story. And then in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23, it's the parable explained. This is the heavenly meaning behind the earthly story. So I read to you in Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9. Let's look at that, not necessarily read the text again, but... Uh, let's go through and interpret what we have for us here in this parable. So as far as an earthly story goes, this parable is about farming. Specifically, it's about sowing seed into the earth. And the focus is uh, not on the sower. The focus is not really on the seed. But the focus is on the dirt. The types of dirt that the farmer is sowing his seed into. So there's four types of dirt that Jesus mentions, four types of soil in this parable. He mentions, first of all, in verse 4, the path. The hardened footpath that crisscrossed the fields in Palestine. Secondly, he mentioned rocky ground. Now, typically rocky soil has a layer of topsoil on it, but underneath it's all stony and rocky. And so stuff can grow there, but it doesn't last. When it gets hot, it dies. Thirdly, he mentioned uh, thorn-infested soil. And you can't grow anything in a thorn-infested 
plot of dirt because the thorns, the weeds, will inevitably choke out the crop. And finally, though, he mentions the good soil. Boy, did stuff ever grow there. 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, to wrap your mind around what kind of a crop that would be, a typical yield in Palestine at that time would have been eightfold. Tenfold would have been phenomenal. So Jesus is using hyperbole here to emphasize the fact that this good dirt which received that seed really bore fruit. And that's crucial to understanding this parable. So, what would have happened if we want to use our imaginations is that the farmer put his seed in his sack and strung it over his shoulders and he went out to his field and this field had some rocky soil and this field had some thorny patches off to the sides and the fields were crisscrossed with footpaths. That was common. People traveled, they would walk through these footpaths which went through farming country, right? So the farmer goes out with his seed in his bag and he grabs when he gets to his field, he reaches into the bag with his hand. He grabs a handful of seed and he throws it out. And he just does this as he walks. It's called broadcasting seed. And so as he broadcasts the seed out onto the ground, some of it inevitably would fall on the hard footpath. And this seed would just lay there. And Jesus says, the birds would see this seed as they do, and they would fly down and they would eat the seed. And as the farmer continued to broadcast his seed, some of it fell upon the rocky soil. And we know what happens when stuff grows on rocky soil. The sun gets hot and dies. There's no root to nourish the plant. Thirdly, Jesus said some of the seeds even landed among the thorns. And, of course, the thorns, the weeds, choked out the good crop, and it died. Finally, though, the seed, some of the seed, maybe hopefully much of the seed, landed on the good soil. And Jesus said it produced an amazing yield. It bore fruit, because the root was able to go down deeply and nourish the plant, and so that the fruit was born upward into a bumper crop. I mean, if you, and you don't have to be a first century Jew living in a, an agrarian culture to get this story. We live in farming country, we've all planted tomatoes at least, and we know how it works. And, and we get this picture, it makes perfect sense to us. But it's not the story, is it? It's a parable which tells us that there is some great spiritual truth that Jesus is illustrating with this parable. And this parable is a kingdom parable. <clears throat> Jesus, in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, is teaching something about the kingdom of God with this dirty story. Specifically, he's talking about how people respond to the gospel. And this is a crucial matter for anyone who would hear this parable. It's so important because it pertains to eternal life or eternal damnation. It's so crucial that people understand this story that Jesus says in verse 9 that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so the Word of God is the Word of God to us. And what I mean by that is that if God is going to speak to us, He's going to speak to us from the Word. And God is saying to each of us this morning, you need to have ears to hear what Jesus is teaching because it has eternal implications. So we have the earthly story. Let's look at the heavenly meaning in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23. <clears throat> Verse 18, Jesus says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Alright, so the seed that landed on the hardened soil of the well-worn footpaths symbolize those who hear the word of the kingdom of God or the gospel 
But Jesus says they don't understand it. And because they don't understand it, the evil one comes, Jesus says, and snatches away what has been sown into his heart. Now, whenever the seed of the gospel is sown into this world, there will be those, perhaps many, unfortunately, who will not understand the gospel. And they don't understand the gospel for a reason. And that reason is unbelief. Their hearts have become hardened by unbelief, just as those footpaths in those ancient fields of Palestine were compacted as hard as concrete from traffic. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The natural person is the unrepentant person, the unregenerate person, the person of unbelief. Paul says that they don't understand the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foolishness to them, and they're not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Such a person who lives in willful rebellion against God, and by their stubborn unbelief reject the things of God as utter foolishness, nonsense, are clearly hard-hearted. And because they are hard-hearted in unbelief, we know that they belong to the evil one, as Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 tell us. And because they belong to the evil one, like the birds that snatch the seed on the heart and the footpath, so the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown into his or her heart. Now Jesus said, if you have ears, you need to have ears to hear. And so we have this first example of the kind of response to the gospel. And it's the hard heart of unbelief. Pray to God that this does not describe you. Now look at verse 20 and 21. This is the next example. As for what was sown on rocky, rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. So far so good, right? But look at verse 21. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while... And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Whenever the seed of the gospel is sown into the world, there will always be those who, without hesitation, immediately receive the good news with joy. And they give every indication that they've been born again. They seem to have this zeal for the Lord. They're excited. They're happy. Everything is going well in terms of their understanding of Jesus and being saved, it seems, anyway. It sure looks like it on the outside. But there's something that happens that shows that they really weren't saved. And that's, in, again, in verse 21 when Jesus says that when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately falls away. Immediately they receive the gospel with joy, but when persecution comes because of Jesus, immediately they fall away. The word fall away comes from the Greek word scandalizo, which is where we get our English word scandalize. And to, be, to scandalize is to, is, means to give offense, to be offended by. So when this person that has the rocky soil heart who has an emotional experience of joy when they hear the good news of Christ, responds outwardly with what seems to be genuine faith, but then when the threat of persecution arises because of the Word, they become scandalized by it. They become offended by the Word and quickly fall away. Now, they didn't lose their salvation their falling away showed that they never had salvation. John MacArthur writes in his commentary on this verse, because their faith in Christ looks uh, lacks 
because their faith in Christ lacks a genuine sorrow over sin, a sincere repentance, a heartfelt hunger for righteousness, and a deep love for the Savior, it never truly took root. Inevitably, when the going gets tough, they abandon their superficial commitment to the Lord. Now, nobody wants to go to hell. But so few are willing to count the cost and pick up their cross and follow Jesus even to the point of suffering. Churches across the globe are filled with superficial followers of Jesus who have had an emotional experience and claim to love Jesus. But when the world in which they live in, when their friends and their co-workers and society at large turns against them because they are a Christian, they are offended by what they once claimed to believe and they push it away and fall away and join with the world. And sometimes that means making their churches like the world. True believers, on the other hand, uh, come to a place through trials and temptations where they will endure for the glory of God because of what Jesus has done for them. For a true believer, suffering and persecution is a, a refining process that not only makes us or teaches us to lean on Jesus, but also makes us holy and fits us for heaven as Hebrews 12, 14 tells us. So, I have to ask, are you a superficial follower of Jesus today? Does the prospect of suffering for Him at the hands of the world offend you? Is God only good when you are not suffering? And if that's your condition for following Jesus, then you are destined without fail to fall away from Him. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We as a church as Christians today are living in a culture that is going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And if you're going to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, which is the only life that a Christian can live, then Jesus says, actually Paul is saying, Jesus is saying through Paul, through inspiration if you will, you will be persecuted. And that's a deal breaker for a lot of people in current evangelicalism today. Because they don't want to lose face with the world. They want the, the, the respect of the world. They want the world's attention. And so they will begin to compromise doctrines of essential Christianity for the sake of getting along with the world because... That's where the heart is. And that's going to take us to the next type of soil in verse 22. Pray to God that the soil of your heart is not that rocky ground, that superficial, churchy, empty, vain, useless Christianity that is not Christianity. Verse 22 says, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world... And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So this is the third type of heart soil in Jesus' parable. And he describes this heart as being thorn infested. And so when the seed of the gospel is sown into that person's heart, when they hear it, it doesn't really take root and grow and bear fruit because their heart never really belonged to Jesus. It was with the world. And so they are worldly or carnal is an older word. They care more about 
the world and their place in it than they do about following Jesus. This is the double-minded person of Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 and verse 24, whom Jesus said tried to serve both God and money. But he said you couldn't. In fact, it's impossible to serve God and mammon, is the King James word, money, the things of the world. It's impossible because you can't serve two masters. God is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. And if you think you can follow Jesus and the world, you're deceiving yourself. Jesus says, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or He will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus says in, in, in no unclear terms, you cannot serve God and money. You cannot be a Christian and be worldly. You see, a worldly Christian, which is not a Christian at all, but a worldly Christian doesn't really have anything invested in Jesus. He's just a means to an end. And that end is usually their best life now. Their heart is for the world. That kind of Christianity, which is no Christianity, has no room for sacrifice, it has no room for suffering, it has no room for dying to self because it is just the opposite of that. It's all about self. And if you believe that you can serve God and money, then you do not understand the gospel and your life will bear this fact out that you are not saved because, this is what Jesus says, you will be unfruitful. That is, you will not bear the fruit of what it means to be saved. You will not bear the fruit of well, let's just look at the good soil, because that's where all the fruit bearing takes place. Look at verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, notice this. This is the one who hears the word, okay? All the other three types of soil, the heart soil condition of that person, they all heard the word, right? The hardened heart heard the word. The uh, rocky soil heart heard the word. The thorn infested heart heard the word. The good soil heart heard the word. Then Jesus says in verse 23, but they understood it. They had ears to hear it. How do we know that? Because that rocky soil heart kind of responded with joy immediately. It seemed like they understood it. You see, but they didn't bear fruit, did they? No, the unbelieving heart, the old hard-hearted sinner, that see, didn't have a chance. It was... Snatched away by the devil before it could do anything. They didn't bear fruit. And that third type of soil, the thorn infested heart, the worldly person. The world choked out the seed. It didn't bear fruit either. We know that a person has heard and understood the gospel because they bear fruit in their life. And if there is no fruit, then there is no Jesus, there is no salvation. That's not my word. It's the Word of God. Look at verse 23 again. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the Word and understands it. And then look what happens next. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and in another thirty. So the, the soil, the good soil heart, in this parable symbolizes the one who hears the gospel but understands the gospel as well. <clears throat> the other three heart conditions, the other three soiled heart conditions, uh, didn't allow for a proper understanding of the gospel, didn't allow for the word to take root, and so it never bore fruit. Only those who bear fruit, and we're going to unpack that in just a second, 
give evidence of being saved. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and are burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Did you catch that? So according to Jesus' words here in John that I just read to you, what did he say was proof positive that you are his disciple? Bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. So what is the fruit that the Christian bears? It's the fruit, first of all, that every Christian should bear if they're a Christian. It's the fruit that is likened unto obedience to the Word of God and the change that that makes in our life. It's called sanctification. It's obedience that leads to sanctification. And the word sanctified is where we get the word saint from. It means to be made holy, to be separated unto something, unto God in this case. You see, that type of person doesn't fall away. They endure. Their obedience transforms them from sinners into saints. Romans 12, 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. The good soil of a heart that has been plowed by the Holy Spirit, repents and believes the gospel and will follow Jesus and obey Him. Jesus Himself tells us in John 14, 15, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 9-10, through 10, we hear these words from the Apostle. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. Oh, there's that seed metaphor. You see, the seed was sown into a heart that was plowed by the Spirit of God. And that seed settled into that row. And it took root. And it bore fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of obedience. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now this obedience is not a sinless perfection. Now we need to take in other scriptures to, to flesh this out fully. And I don't have a lot of time to do that this morning, but in passing, let me say this. When God saves a person, their sins are washed away, past, present, and future. They are justified before God. So your, your current standing before God in Jesus is one of sinlessness. You're no longer guilty. You're purified, holy, righteous, and, and, and true. That's your position in Jesus. But what Jesus has made you positionally before God, He's going to work out in you practically as well. He's going to make you what you are positionally. He's going to make you holy. And it, and it goes on throughout our lives until we're actually with Him. That's when it's completed at the resurrection glorification of our bodies. But in the process of being sanctified, you find as a Christian... That there's this struggle now with sin that you didn't have. Before, you might not have liked the consequences of your actions, but you really didn't care and you just wanted to sin. But now in Christ, you no longer want to sin, but you also still want to sin. You are simultaneously holy and sinful. 
And by that it means there is remaining sin in what the Bible calls the flesh. And so Paul says it's a law. That whenever you want to do what is right, sin is there in the flesh ready to convince you to do the opposite. That's why you struggle when you want to pray. It's why your mind wanders when you pray. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Every time you, you want to commit yourself to reading the Bible, your spirit is willing, but the flesh says, the hood, boy, don't do that. And then when the flesh is saying, don't do the things of God, the devil's there going, yeah, don't do the things of God. Let me offer you something else. And the world says, yeah, let us help you. So when we talk about practicing obedience, it's not a sinless obedience. But it's obedience and you're making progress and you sin less. So how can I know what is the condition of my heart soil? More importantly, how can I know if I've heard the gospel and understood it? How can I know that I'm saved? We already know the answer. It's so simple, isn't it? The answer is, are you bearing fruit? How can I know that I'm saved? Oh, I had this wonderful experience. It doesn't count. I mean, it counts if it's genuine, but that's not the basis of your assurance. I remember the hour. Well, heck, I remember the day, the hour. I remember everything. And you may very well. But if your go-to answer for how can I be sure I'm saved is my emotional experience... Wrong. Well, I said a prayer. Wrong. I was baptized. Wrong. Jesus doesn't tell us to look to a feeling. He doesn't tell us to look to a sinner's prayer because that's not even in the Bible. And He doesn't tell us to look to baptism because baptism is, is really a profession of faith. It's a confessing and, and it is a picture, much like a parable, of what Jesus has done in you. And it pictures His death, burial, and resurrection and your own death, burial, and resurrection. Death to sin, resurrection to walk in newness of life. No, Jesus says what you look to to see if your soil, if your, the soil of your heart is good soil is whether or not you're bearing fruit. Is your life marked by the practice of obedience to His Word or is your life marked by a consistent pattern of willful, defiant rebellion against God? Because a lot of people in the church think that they said a sinner's prayer, they're not going to hell, so they can live their lives the way they want. And that's not even in the Bible anywhere. Jesus says, if you are saved, you will bear fruit. And so I, I would put it to you this way. Is your life being transformed by the Word of God to the degree that you are becoming less worldly and more Christ-like? Less sinful and more holy. Now when a Christian, someone who is saved, hears that, is my life becoming more holy than sinful? A real born-again Christian realizes the ugliness of sin. And here's the thing about being a Christian, walking with Christ. The more you walk with Christ, and the closer He draws you to Himself, the more He transforms you in the process of sanctification, the more you hate sin in you. And so you have this really deep hatred of remaining sin in your life. Now, I don't want you to confuse the, the awareness of the blackness of your heart with the ongoing practice of willful and defiant rebellion against God. There's two different things there. Struggling with sin. Hating the sin in your life. Wanting to obey Jesus. Striving to obey Jesus. Loving Jesus because He has saved you and He's loved you first. Wanting to stop sinning is all indications that the seed of the Word has taken root in your life. And if that seed is there, if Jesus is there, He will not leave you fruitless. You will bear fruit, guaranteed. 
And that's the surest test in the Bible of whether or not you are saved is if you're bearing fruit. Look at it this way. The Christian life is a life of repentance. Not to get saved over and over and over again. But to repent because we continue to sin. Not in a willful, defiant, I hate God and love sin sinning. But, oh God, I have sinned again. Please help me with this. Forgive me of this. Wash me clean. Kill this sin in me. That is the Christian life. We never stop repenting until we're with Him. Now if on the other hand, your life isn't producing such fruit, then the soil of your heart is either hard-hearted unbelief, rocky soil, superficial, churchy Christianity that falls away when tested, or a thorn-infested soil of a heart that loves the world more than following Jesus. If that's the case, then you're not saved. And you need to pray to God that He would give you hear, ears to hear and a heart and mind to understand the truth and that the Holy Spirit would grant unto you repentance and faith that leads to eternal life and that you will live the rest of your life even if it means suffering for Jesus to bring glory to God by your loving, heartfelt obedience to His Word so that you bear that good fruit of righteousness. Now that's biblical Christianity. And there is no other shades of that in the Bible. There are not those who are saved but not disciples of Jesus. That's, you know, the big group. But within that bigger circle, you have this core group of people who are saved and really committed. No. That, that, that kind of hazy mass of, I'm not going to hell, Christians, but don't follow Jesus, aren't Christians. Only those who follow Him. Who keep His commandments. And I'm telling you right now, when the preacher gets to that point and makes that salvation that narrow, if you're not willing to follow Jesus and suffer for Jesus, you're not willing to uh, wean yourself away from the world by obedience to Him, when the preacher makes the gospel that narrow, very few people want to walk through the narrow gate. But that's the gate that Jesus said leads to life. What most people want when they hear the gospel is they want the gospel that is not the gospel. It's the gospel that's on the wide path that Jesus said leads to destruction. You see, on the wide path, there's no resistance. You get along with the world. You can have Jesus, the Jesus that keeps you from hell and gives you your best life now, which is not the Jesus of the, of the Bible in terms of giving you the world while He gives you heaven. We are sojourners and exiles, Peter says, in this world. The wide path leads to destruction. Nobody's going to persecute you for your faith there. And if you're on that path as a Christian, well, you're not on the narrow path, are you? So I didn't make the path narrow. I didn't make the gospel narrow. Jesus has made it narrow. And it's the only way. And if you reject that, there's no hope. I pray this morning that all of our hearts have been plowed up by the Spirit of God and that the Word of God has taken root in us. And we're not perfect. We know we're not perfect. Nobody has to tell us that we're not perfect. But there's a difference now. And I love Him. And I want to obey Him. God help me to do so. Not because I'm trying to earn anything, but because He is saved. You can be a Christian, and like the man in the Bible, Jesus, I believe and help my unbelief. That's a good description of the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak Christian, which is what it means to be a Christian. But you know, there's something we didn't look at here, and I'm almost done. 
right in the middle of, between, I should say, the parable of the soils and then the explanation, there's a passage of Scripture of why Jesus preaches in parables. He says to hide truth from those who don't believe. He told his disciples, it's been given you to understand. It's been given to you to understand. But I speak in parables for those who don't understand so they won't hear. So inevitably, when you preach the gospel, these stories, whether it's a parable or just a straight up truth, without any illustrations, it's going to go right over people's heads. But they're just not listening. And they don't care. I pray that's not you today. Let's stand together and pray. Precious Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you, God, that it is not complicated. It is narrow, but it is not complicated. It is you and you alone by whom, through whom, we can be saved. Lord, let us be willing to count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus and realize and be glad to say it, that it is worth it because you are worth it. For you alone have died, O oh God, to save us from our sins, from your wrath in hell, to give us life eternal, to be with you forever and forever as your own dear children. Let us look at the suffering that would become a part of our lives as Christians as a reason to share with you, Jesus, in your suffering so that our lives would bring glory and honor to God. Examine our hearts. Plow up the hard soil that is our heart. And may your word find a resting place that it will take root and grow and bear fruit. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Number 311. 311. Yeah.